Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Stuart Diller. Stuart is the CEO of Estat Actuation, a company that makes electroadhesive clutches here in Pittsburgh. Stuart, welcome to the pod. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks for coming on. It's been a long time coming. I'm, I'm excited to finally get to hang out with you here. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess just for people listening, what is an electroadhesive clutch? Certainly. So an electroadhesive clutch takes advantage of working on a completely different mechanism than conventional clutches. So we're using electroadhesion rather than electromagnetism or something similar. And that means our clutches are 10 times lighter, 10 times more compact, and 1,000 times more efficient than the conventional versions. Interesting. So we're using voltage fields rather than magnetic fields. And that would sound like BS, except I've seen it, and it isn't. <laughs> so. Sure, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. That we, we always get a healthy dose of skepticism from the technical uh, people we talk to. Yeah, but I, no, I mean, you showed me at that uh, Cascadia event, uh, like your latest demo, and it was super impressive. I mean, the thing is crazy light. Like, I mean, I don't know, like, what is that, like a couple of ounces, if I had to guess yeah, like, what yeah. that thing weighs? Mm -hmm. And then, like, I could not turn it when you cranked up the voltage. It didn't shock me, which I, I thought it was hmm. going to get shocked for sure. Sure. No, yeah. What, what voltages are you pumping through that sucker? Uh, so we're applying in the 100 to 500 volts range. Okay. Uh, that sounds pretty high. Conventional electrostatic technology is typically more in the thousands. So uh, being in the hundreds means we can use pretty standard electrical components, which yeah, is yeah. great for cost and size. And then the currents are extremely low. So. Um, peak currents are in the milliamps range, and maintenance currents are in the microamps range. So that's how we're using so little energy that it's just microwatts. Does, does the current spike up when it encounters resistance then? Or like when you say peak current, what causes a peak? Sure. So essentially, we're getting into some good detail here. Yeah. Essentially, uh, the clutches <laughs> act like capacitors from an electrical perspective. Cool. So they'll charge up and discharge kind of with the typical RC um, resistance times capacitance. Is that because you've got like two parallel plates? Basically? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, so it is a capacitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We, we've basically taken, think about a thin film capacitor. You unfold it down to one layer and then the uh, construction is like you take a thin film capacitor, unfold it into one layer with an electrode, dielectric and electrode, cut it down the middle. Uh, so now you've got two electrodes that are separate and can physically move relative to one another. And then you apply a voltage across them and they adhere from basic electrostatic attraction, positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other. So in any thin film capacitor that you use, it's, it's squeezing the dielectric in there. You can't <laughs> tell because it's incompressible, uh, but we essentially, you know, cut it in half and then take advantage of that across an interface. That's clever. How'd you come up with that idea? Cause uh, it just seems like novel. I mean, sure. Well, uh, electroadhesion has uh, been known to scientists since the late 1800s. Uh, and this was fun to, to really go back uh, during my PhD thesis defense and give credit to everyone who's worked on it. So, you know, got to do that in academia, give credit to everybody. Nice. Um, but they were working, so originally they were looking to use it for things like microphones or telephones and uh, electro uh, magnets won out in that case, it was a better technology, but they were using very Oh, interesting. Non-engineering materials. So, um, for example, pigskin was used in some of the Weird. earliest ones as the dielectric material, right? That so, footballs, I guess. Yeah, not, not particularly effective. Um, then, you know, some more work was done on it in academia and industry through the last hundred years. And then I'd say what really enabled us um, during my PhD in the research lab to make it effective as an actual real world component was having much better materials available to us. Yeah. So that's just a function of... I'm going to sound like an idiot, but the dielectric's sure. the thing between the two conductive plates? Exactly, yes. Okay, the insulating layer. Sure yeah. following. Okay. Totally. Cool. Yeah. So I, I've known that, but it's like one of those things where like I forget like if like a few years go by since I've used the knowledge. Totally, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, first thing, 
we have better access to materials so we can do better things. The second thing was the design aspect. So there were important aspects of the design that failed previous attempts, but that we got right in our attempt and really enable it to overcome the practical issues that existed before. That's cool. Can you say what any of that stuff is? I mean, I think you guys sure. have patents on it, right? Yeah, we've got a, a good few patents at this point. Um, four granted, three uh, in the international phase, and nine provisionals at this Sweet. point. So definitely a big part of our business. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's a physical piece of hardware, so yeah. you could rip that off if you didn't have that kind yeah, exactly, of Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the big important aspects is that you need to have thin, flexible films. So previous attempts at this would often use big rigid plates. Oh, interesting. And big rigid plates don't have good surface contact with one another typically. So you need sense. to preload them and they wear away really and quickly. And you probably have to machine them down to like a mirror finish in exactly. order to even have a prayer. Yeah. So instead, if you use at least one thin flexible film, then it can actually adhere to a surface and conform to the surface and generate a lot higher uh, force or torque. Well, that's, that so technically you only need one flexible plate, but if you've got two, it makes it weigh a lot less. Exactly. So with most of our devices, we're using two, but we also, you know, uh, we make a few different kinds, uh, you know, surface clutches, linear clutches, rotary clutches, um, really, you know, anywhere. We like to call it electric glue. What's, for a, what's the general a surface audience. clutch? Surface clutch, yes. Surface clutch embodies both um, gripping things but also being able to like make quick mechanical connects or disconnects. As well. Oh, that's cool. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's like getting two surfaces to mate up or unmate. Yeah, exactly. So Sweet. if you think about like modular systems or something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I, I do hear about like examples. I've not done this personally yet, but of like electroadhesion being used in conveyance. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah. yeah, so I mean. It so I think uh, there's a company called Grabit that was out of California that focused a lot on creating things like conveyor belts that used um, comb style electroadhesion. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And what is comb style? Yeah. So uh, the... I'm picturing like the comb on a Van de Graaff generator, but I don't know if that's... Pretty similar. Okay, yeah. cool. Idea being that you have uh, two interdigitated electrodes. Interdigitated means like they're overlapping with little things. Yeah. So it'd, it'd be a planar design uh, with combs that kind of interlock so it kind of looks like the close-up of like a MEMS accelerometer yeah, yeah. okay cool. um, and so then you're generating a voltage field across the the fingers um, our all of our devices are just planar devices so it doesn't require any comb style electrodes uh, which simplifies things a good bit and um, actually increases the amount of force or torque in like a self-contained device which I think is really the thing that we're doing that's most unique that hasn't been done before commercially is a self-contained clutch component that you know is 10 times lighter 10 times more compact thousand times more efficient um, and has all the same basic performance metrics that are necessary uh, for industrial medical robotics applications that's awesome what did you do your phd in like what made you kind of come down this road like you know where'd you turn left as it were certainly yeah so i uh, did my undergrad in mechanical engineering in virginia at university of virginia cool and then was considering what to do after and applied to some jobs, applied to some um, grad school programs and got a really cool offer from Carnegie Mellon to come and work with uh, two faculty members, um, Carmel Majidi and Steve Collins. Cool. And uh, working at the kind of intersection of two labs gave me the opportunity to take expertise from each of them and kind of combine them together. And that's, oh, that's where we got, you know, the one lab uh, it was called the Soft Machines Lab. Did a lot of thin film, soft material, hardware work. The other lab was um, a biomechanics uh, and exoskeletons and prostheses lab. Oh, cool. So really, the motivation was: can we take some of this um, novel technology on the hardware side and use it to enable really cool exoskeletons or prostheses or wearable robotics? I can see why you're asking me the questions about prosthetics earlier now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's cool. um, yeah. So, I mean, that's a really excellent application for our kind of technology because uh, it's worn on the body. So it needs to be really lightweight. Right. So exoskeletons really suffer from having particularly actuator components that are way too heavy. And uh, that essentially just bogs you down, makes you a lot slower and negates any benefit from sure, actually using now the exoskeleton. You gotta carry all that crap along with you. Exactly. Uh, and the power consumption is really important because 
you don't want them to heat up if they're on your body because that's yeah. uncomfortable or could burn you, but also because you're operating on a battery, right? So the, yeah. the battery life is a main constraint on the, the operation time and the cost. Of these but do you really need like a clutch on an exoskeleton? Like I always think of that as being more like actuators than clutches. But Yeah, so this is a really interesting avenue to go down in exoskeleton design and biomechanics work. Um, but essentially... One of the things that I did during my PhD with some video on YouTube as well was use the clutches in a um, walking exoskeleton huh. that assists you on the ankle. And it replicates uh, the assistance pattern from a, a previous study that showed that you can reduce the metabolic cost of walking by 6% compared to not wearing the exoskeleton with a completely unpowered exoskeleton. So there were no motors, no batteries, nothing. All it was doing was changing your biomechanics as you walked to be By more like efficient. By like locking up at certain times. Exactly. So as a, yeah. as a clutch and spring where it clutched in the spring when your foot's on the ground. So it assists your plantar flexion and dorsal oh, flexion. Interesting. And then it unclutches when your foot is in the air because you need to be able to pick your toe up to not scuff your toe on the ground. Yeah. And the so, spring is fighting against your toe being picked up. Yeah, exactly. that makes sense. So uh, it's actually mimicking a lot of what your Achilles tendon and soleus. Oh, so you're not just rigidizing your links. You're, you're introducing that spring and springiness. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting. So there's a lot of, uh, analogs. Actually, the most successful industrial exoskeletons right now are also unpowered. Yeah. So I've noticed that. That's how they get the cost to the point where it, it makes it cost effective and also gets rid of a lot of the challenging engineering issues. So they're, they're, fairly limited in terms of what they can do. Like they'll support your arms doing an overhead task. Yeah. Uh, but nothing else. But, you know, that's essentially where, where the industry is. There are definitely some, some cutting edge robotics companies making more active and, and powered exoskeletons. Sure. Um, but there's still more work to be done to get there in terms of cost and wide scale, scale applicability. And I think that's where we could fit in is um, using electroadhesive clutches means now you can make it smart, right? You can make the assistance adjustable. You can make the assistance, um, yeah, adjust to a user in real time, uh, which is not possible if it's just a completely passive system. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. And like, because you're drawing so little power, like you, you can do that at minimal expense. You don't need like a generator on board, for instance, like I've seen on certain powered exoskeletons or yeah you know, a giant battery pack that only lasts 30 minutes uh, because, you know, you're only drawing like milliamps or microamps. Yeah, our, our voltage driver um, can last for hours and it has a battery inside. It's about the size of a stick of gum and, Sweet. you know, just a few grams of weight. That was the so. one you showed me at Cascadia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that, it was pretty tiny. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So I'm going to change subject here for a moment. Um, you started telling me about these micro mouse competitions yeah. before we started. And I, I was kind of curious to hear more about what that is. Uh, sure. A little bit of a tangent for people listening, sorry. but Certainly, no. Well, yeah. I, and I've only seen about 10, 10 minute video on YouTube, but I was pretty fascinated by it. it made me think, um, you know, I have to get, get my nephews into it and help them make some. But I think it started in the 70s or 80s as basically just build a robotic mouse to solve a maze and do it as fast as possible. Uh, and so there's innovation happening on the hardware side and on the software side, which is really fun. What I was getting to tell you, telling you about was one of the most recent innovations, which makes them go faster than you can really track with your eye. They're just speeding through. It's incredible <laughs> seeing them speed through the mazes is they'll put these um, small drone motors on with fans. Uh, and they run them to give them as much downforce as possible. Oh, that's so not they're, what I was they're getting like, you know, five G's of downforce or something. That's wild. So then they can take these ridiculous corners because <laughs> otherwise they'd be sliding all over the place. Right. Yeah. So that was, that was the most recent innovation that, you know, have to the times to solve the puzzles. Essentially, That's wild. You know? Cause typically they would, you know, someone would come up with a new idea, then everyone adopts it and then they optimize it and the times kind of level out until the next big optimization comes and then they drop again. And you know? one person just wipes the floor with everyone else whenever the next big optimization comes yeah. out until they yeah. all adopt it the next year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's wild. what are some of the other optimizations that have been done in that? that well, the, the big the software side YouTube one video. was the, the, <laughs> the optimization of the search algorithms, right? So you've got the greedy searches or you've got the sparse searches and, um, you know, you can you can optimize all sorts of little bits and pieces. Can you see the full uh, maze before the mouse goes down it, or do you have to go down every corner? I think what they do is they give you three runs, 
and people typically use the first run to try to map out the oh, entire that's maze. Oh, interesting. And yeah. they, so they have a really slow time, but then the second time they give it an optimization try and see how they do, and then the third time they see, you know, can I beat that? Nice. Yeah. Is there, can you have user intervention or does it have to do it totally autonomous? I think it's completely autonomous. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So it's definitely a challenge. I mean, these are tiny little things to work on too. I mean, I'm sure you'd be great at it with your company. But, oh, thanks. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems like fun. I just haven't had time for anything oh, sure, extracurricular yeah. at all lately. I used to do battle bots and Oh great. Yeah, that was fun. I mean when I was in the field robotic center, um I think we met around that time, mm -hmm. but I, I was I was doing a lot of battle bot stuff just to kinda of pass the time. I had sort of a bad breakup and mm. Was trying to get over it, and um, I, I just spent a lot of hours on Bridgeport J heads, you know, uh, turning down metal and yeah, you know, uh, drill pressing through titanium and you know, bolting stuff together and putting together wiring harnesses. And what um, was your weapon of choice? So the one I used on my favorite um, battle bot that I had was it was a six pound. So the the whole thing weighed thirty pounds. So mm -hmm. um, I had kind of a light weapon. Like a lot of people will put like a third of their weight into their weapon. Mm. Um, but I, I only had a six pound, uh, weapon that I took off a 15 pound battle bot mm -hmm. and I repurposed it, um, to, it would spin above the, uh, it would spin at like, um, in like a karate chop position, if you mm. will. And then I had a cam on the back of it that would lift up the whole bar that was spinning like 6,000 RPM. And then the cam had a cliff, so it would just drop. Mm. And then I had, um, two big, um, tension springs which I later changed to one big tension spring because of weight mm -hmm. and also like it just was unnecessary amount of tension springs. And the idea was the thing would cam while the thing was spinning at 6,000 RPMs, pop, like lift up and then slam down on the top armor of the opponent. Wow. It was really novel at the time because nobody really armored their top because mm. there weren't a whole lot of top attacking battle bots. And then sure. I don't know if he copied me or if he did it on his own, but like Jamison Go, who just won the last season, came mm. out with one called Sawblaze. Wow. Like around the same time or, or the next year um, that was way better than mine, um, but a similar concept. Cool. And so I actually saw him at the Boston event and I gave him a hug. He had his, oh, his bottom awesome. display in the, in the beginning. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if he got the idea from me, but um, sure. It, I'm sad I missed that. I, we we yeah. were very occupied at our booth for sure. Dude, but. that's whenever I have a booth, I get that way. Like I mm. will, um, like PRN Discovery Day. Like I didn't get to talk to anyone, and I don't remember any conversation because I just had like you know a thousand people come up to me at this booth, and mm -hmm. you know the whole thing's a blur. And I, I had some really deep conversations that I don't remember having because I kind of just blacked out from like yeah. the information overload. Um, one guy who was like an awesome systems engineer, um, Chuck Trail, uh, if you're listening, I love you, you're great. But um, he and I had coffee and I just did not remember meeting him. And hmm. I was like really excited because um, you know there was like some great synergies at work. And I'm like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Like, I just acted like an ass. Definitely a blur, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, at the same time, like you said, I mean, your, people are coming to you, you can show off your tech. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, booths are a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, we, we definitely have different strategies, booth strategies, how to attract people over. Um, uh, our VP Kirby is definitely the best at it. And she'll, she'll grab people who, you know, you've always got the people who don't look very interested or the ones who are like laser focused on something else. And she, she somehow has a way about getting them in and getting them interested. Um, and I'm, I'm a bit more shy, so I'm always like slyly trying to get people's attention a little bit, you know, <laughs> and failing most of the time. I'll just put robots up on the counter and that seems yeah, that to get people too. interested. So Definitely. there's, um, I'll bring that Ruktra robot. Like if I've got a booth, um, I'll bring some of the miniature, uh, models that that was based off of the one you saw in the maze over there. Mm -hmm. And I'll just put those across the front and then yeah. I'll, I'll put like a whole bunch of swag and that seems to get people's attention. Definitely. And then, you know, it's kind of, and then I'll play, you know, our promo video on loop on a monitor uh, behind me. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, um, uh, positives and negatives or blessings and curses, right? Our demo is currently great for feeling like as a tactile experience, it blows people's minds. Yeah. And it looks professional, but it doesn't look like a really cool robot that does all these cool things yet, right? So we've got the tactile part. We're working on the visual part. Oh, so you're like the guy that's like selling motors or something. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. ah, it's boring. I don't want to see these motors. But really, it's like if you knew how... 
yeah, when you ex- when you experience it, yeah. people get it, right? But yeah. uh, you have to get them in to experience it. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you say what you're working on to kind of improve the the pitch visually, or? Sure. Well, uh, we've made a lot of progress recently um, with our products, uh, not only looking but just performing very professionally and up to you know customer standards. So. This yeah, year I we mean, I agree they're awesome. Yeah, this I was, I was this year really we with the last gen. launched our newest ones um, and uh, have a lot of traction with customers, and I think in large part because they look and feel very professional. Yeah. Okay, so it's just making a better looking actuator is, is what it comes down <laughs> to. Exactly, it's all about yeah. looks, right? Yeah. Uh, no, we'll 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 make every everything about the actuator look better when yeah. it's you know smaller. More compact. Yeah. Fair, I thought it was going to be like some kind of a booth demo that like grabbed people's attention somehow. So we do have the uh, Spider-Man video on the website at least. I kind of buried it as a hidden gem uh, a little bit. I don't think I've seen this yet. Sure. Well, it's it's uh, we used some of the surface clutches to show that you can basically uh, hang off the ceiling with two two of them. So there's a video of me oh, hanging cool. off the ceiling with a couple of the surface clutches. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I got to find that video now. Now I want to watch that. Yeah. That sounds- yeah. Check out the website, eatstat.tech. Eatstat.tech. Check it out. But um, do you do you have like handles on them? Like how does that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so that one's cool. with handles, yeah. 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 So you actually have like a Spider-Man thing that like presumably someone in your lab made. And Yeah, we made it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I think we took it, the video um, on the bridge between Hammerschlag and, oh gosh. What's the name of the robotics building at CMU? I'm Noel forgetting. Simon Hall. Noel Simon. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the little sky bridge there. I think, isn't um, that between Gates and Noel Simon? I'm not mistaken. That's the uncovered one. There's the covered right. one between okay. Hammerschlag and Noel Simon. Yeah. I don't know about that one. Uh, huh, is that new or has, have I just missed that? Oh, uh, I'm an idiot. Know. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll have to look at a campus map after Yeah, I'll get the map out. There's, it's such yeah. a maze over there at CMU. Yeah. yeah, they're always building like, you know, three new buildings to try to spend some of that sweet, sweet endowment money, I yeah. feel like, every year. Yeah, new new SCAFE. Um, There's a I, new SCAFE? I, yeah, I'll have to. Does I'm excited. Does it look like a potato chip or did they go with No, the no, chip? yeah, it looks, it looks very nice. Um, it's a little <laughs> bit sad because I spent, you know, five years, five and a half years in the windowless basement of the old SCAFE. I spent uh, a lot then they of time demolished in the it right after the field robotics center. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but progress moves forward, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I feel like, I mean, the interest in that endowment's just got to be like ballooning out of control. So, I mean, they probably just have more money than they know what to do with, I think. Definitely on a, a building buying campaign through Oakland as well. Yeah. That's wild. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. What have they? What all have they bought up? Like, just uh, sorry if, if you're not from Pittsburgh. This is going to be sure. boring for the next few minutes. <laughs> um, at least our the, they built that new dorm on um, Fifth. I didn't know about um, this. Across from the uh, WQED. Oh, cool! With the uh, with the building. dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that the former home of uh, Fred Rogers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, Mr. Rogers um, came to Grandparents' Day at my elementary school when I was a kid. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah the perk of growing up in Pittsburgh. Mm. Uh, so I, I got to meet him as a kid. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, definitely watched yeah. a lot as a kid myself. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So tell me a little bit about your team. Yeah, definitely a, a great team of people who are excited to be in Pittsburgh, for one thing, which is fun. Um, Mostly technical team now, so we've got um, Kirby's in charge on the uh, mechanical side. Yeah, uh, I've heard really good things about her. I don't think I've met her yet. You should definitely meet her. Yeah, yeah. she's she's very sharp and a uh, great designer. Kirby, if I've met you and I forgot, I'm really sorry. <laughs> sure. Uh, and then uh, Jaden is a, so lots of CMU grads. Jaden's a CMU grad on the mechanical side. Cool. Um, we've got Bill, who does electrical work for us. Uh, Kelsey and Kevin on the material side. John leads our materials team, and then uh, we've got Max, who's our uh, product and uh, product manager. Uh, Sweet. As Do you well, guys so. have um, custom materials that you're running then? If you've got materials behind us? Yes, the materials are a big part of it. Uh, we've got some trade secret materials nice. that we're using that give us um, really excellent performance, uh, and uh, yeah, definitely a central. 
part of our strategy. That's badass. I didn't realize you were doing that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was a fun part of my PhD as well. That you know, it's uh, certainly being at CMU, you get a chance to be really interdisciplinary. So yeah, for sure. I was I was very focused on mechanical engineering and robotics and electrical engineering and material science, kind of all at once. And being able to go around and talk to a bunch of the different faculty was really helpful for That's that. That's awesome. Lots of different experts. But yeah, so we're looking to grow the team as well. Um, big priority right now is finding an excellent business development person. So Sweet. we're looking for that person who has, you know, uh, really deep industry experience in motion control and in uh, actuators um, to, you know, drive us forward with customers. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'll think if I can recommend anyone there. I, that was the one person I thought of earlier, but mm. um, if you're interested and you know the actuators market and specifically clutches, uh, yeah. get a hold of Stuart. What's the best way to reach you? Yes, yeah, so my email is stuart at eastat.tech. Um, or you know, you can find more information on the website and just apply through the careers page as well. Sweet. And LinkedIn. LinkedIn, yep, email? totally on LinkedIn. And yeah, f- uh, follow us on LinkedIn. We've got a great LinkedIn page. Um, try to keep it up to date with posts about what we're up to. Sweet. You'll have to boost this episode. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's a good spot to end. Great. Stuart, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And, really fun uh, talking to you, Spencer. Yeah, you too. I'll see you on the next one. Great. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SK Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SK Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.